What am I working with? Dan, you have to take a, a finger. I feel for you all. You can do that. You'll only lose by 20. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Utter Punts. We're back to bring you our take on some of the biggest stories coming out of the NFL this week. It's incredibly boring. How is that yeah, boring? Uh, Carry on. Shut up, you. <laughs> if anybody mentions Taylor Swift, it's a straight red card and a two-pod ban. We got everything right last week. Yeah, cruised it last week. I'm pretty sure I only got one wrong. Professional, one wrong. <laughs> Unbelievable. I tell you what, I tell you what, it's very yeah. This week I'm joined by Dave, Jim, and Ollie, and on the way we'll discuss how terrible the Giants are and whether the landslide win for the Vikings was Minnesota being good or New York being that bad. Plus, Caleb Williams had an inauspicious start with the Chicago Bears. Does a win for them? override a terrible performance. We'll talk about the new contract for Dak Prescott and the Cowboys' performance against a very ordinary Brown side. All of that and much more on the way. This is Utter Punt. Uh, welcome along, gentlemen. Um, a good weekend for some, a horrible weekend for others. Jim, how are you feeling? I'm in the horrible camp, Liam, to be honest. <laughs> Me too, mate. Me too. Ollie? I'm in the really positive camp. <laughs> yeah, fuck you. <laughs> Echoed. Um, yeah, the Vikings had a really good start to the season. I think most people expected us to beat the Giants. Uh, you know, there are a couple of teams in this uh, league at the minute that if you're coming up against them, you know, people are going to discredit your win. Uh, the Panthers, the Giants, you know, the, the, there's a few of you. Tennessee probably is another one. Uh, but, you know, the thing is the Vikings, we haven't won by 17 points or more in a single game since 2019. Uh, we're the only team in the NFL to have that record. Even the worst teams during that period, like the Bears, have had six wins by 17 points or more. And we've come up against shit teams during that time like the Panthers last year and not done that. Sam Darnold, really impressive. You know, in the first half, he had 12 out of 12 completions. I think he ended the game with 200 yards and two passing touchdowns. But yeah, I'll, ju I'll just give it over to Dave because it was a really exciting first display for us. Cheshire, Cheshire cat that is Dave Keene. He's just been grinning from the moment that he came onto the pod. <laughs> um, did the Vikings win? No, look, the truth of the matter is the Giants weren't very good, but we all know that. Um, and it, it, it's literally one of those where things look great from after the first couple of plays, because once again, the Vikings gave a ball away with a fumble very early on. And at that point, I did think that Liam would be having a, a rather good experience coming back into this. Um, but... All in all, it, 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 was, it was a fantastic day. It was um, a day where results went kind of kindly overall. The Vikings did what they needed to do. Aaron Jones looked every inch the 18th best back in the league, um, as described by Jim last week. Um, and, like, yeah, it just, just made no difference at all. None at all to the team. I'm, I'm really glad you're lighting that touch paper for me, Dave, so thanks for that. Um, just to completely discredit the Vikings win, uh, you, you, you were playing the worst team in football. Uh, but uh, I mean, it's arguable between you know them and the Panthers. Um, it wasn't. I think it was what six, seven months ago that you thought Josh Dobbs was the second coming of Jesus Christ. The so, Pastoral was incredible. So, Don't you knock so, him? So Sam Darnold having one good game. Uh, yeah, best of luck with that one, pal. Um, to be honest. So, yeah, I mean, look, when you actually play someone decent, they're going to put 40 points on you. and you San probably Francisco score, next weekend. Yeah, you're, in, you're in deep trouble. So, yeah, good times. It's a, it's a roller coaster for you, Dave. Obviously, you come up against the worst team in football in week one, and then week two, have the best team in football. There you go, delivered d directly to your door. Look, I, I, watched, I watched New York Giants get outplayed in every aspect of that game. And I think the most depressing thing is that Daniel Jones and his fat new contract was outplayed by Sam Darnold. And no, I, I, 
in the nicest possible way. That should not happen. Six years, six years we've been talking about this. Six seasons we have been talking about Daniel Jones and whether he's good enough. And, and it makes the pick in the draft, it makes the Giants' first round pick in the draft an absolute mockery. An absolute mockery. You have to take a quarterback. You have to take a quarterback because Daniel Jones just isn't good enough. He's not good enough. And instead, you take neighbours and you think to yourself, oh, yeah, that will solve the fucking problem. Not even close. So as much as I'm delighted for you and Ollie, Dave, that you've managed to pick up a win in your first game, I'm, I'm kind of siding with Jim on this one. Let's see what happens when you face somebody that isn't the New York Giants because I guarantee you they will be walked all over all season long by everybody and let me tell you if they play the Panthers at any stage Jesus fucking Christ how miserable will that be you are playing them on a neutral field nobody wins that nobody wins in Munich you're playing them in Munich What a game Nobody for the German 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 fans that will be. Uh, you know, three nothing uh, to the Panthers for a, a last minute field goal. So I saw oh, I, I saw someone say that's America's final punishment for World War Two is a <laughs> That is all the accurate. It just uh, it, it you know uh, expansion and, and growing the game is a really important thing. Uh, that game will do less for the expansion of the NFL than anything that they've ever done previously just just give it give it a swerve give the Giants a swerve all season long dreadful dreadful I've given up I'm not doing it anymore I'm not it's, watching it's, it's going to get Dayball fired as well oh, and, yeah. he's a sitting Dayball doing. feels like a sitting duck to me yeah I mean who's the backup is there a competent backup at the Giants I don't know. I'm... Isn't it that not mafia yeah, Italian Italian American got... dude? Yeah, Tommy DeVito uh, or something yeah, like that. DeVito. Tommy DeVito. Oh, he's yeah, still yeah. DeVito. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'd go with yeah. him over Daniel Jones. I mean, the... you know, I they were sorry to interrupt you, Jim. There were hundreds of Giants fans that stayed after the game just to give him pelters as he walked out. That's where we're at. I saw videos on social media of fans burning Daniel Jones shirts. Wow. That's not too dissimilar to uh, to what I imagined was uh, the, the, the outcome in Cleveland yesterday, to be honest with you. Uh, the Boo Boys were out from halfway through the second quarter, but we'll get on to uh, the, the fine Browns mess uh, as usual in a little bit, I think. I think we should give the boys their, their moment in, in the sun in terms of the Vikings, you know, destroying the Giants and I think you know where we look at when we do look at it yeah I joke about Sam Darnold Sam Darnold is far higher thought of in the league than any of the press or anybody else like that that's why he was back up in San Francisco last year he's had a year uh, in the Kyle Shanahan um, quarterback rehabilitation center so coming out of that going to the Vikings uh, it was, it, it, I thought it was an expensive signing for a backup signing in the off season, uh, ten million a year. Um, but realistically, now with McCarthy being out for the year, ten million for a starting quarterback's nothing. And if Donald keeps on the trajectory and if they can game plan effectively, and you know the Vikings have got the weapons to 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 do some damage on offense, then I think Donald could well look like uh, you know a, a competent quarterback for possibly the first full season in his career. So, and that's not a knock. Uh, that's not me being uh, you know funny or anything. That's just that's just a fact. That, you know he's had bit he's he's had ups and downs throughout his career. Um, and I think it'd be interesting to see what he does against the 49ers. Big shout out to Brian Flores uh, for the Vikings defense. Absolutely terrorized the Giants yesterday. Uh, Van Ginkle with uh, one of the strangest uh, but but most entertaining pick sixes I've seen, um, taking a sidearm pass from Daniel Jones back for six, uh, while uh, the Giants fan shakes his head. I think everybody else was probably sitting there in great amusement and, and cheering. I, well, it, it, at that, I, so. I agree, but then when you look at it, that's a pick six in 1.13 seconds. That's what that was. The fastest pick six for three seasons or something ridiculous and Do you want to know what happened and that now confirms Daniel Jones is throwing more pick sixes since his new contract than actual touchdown passes to Giants players wow so no, the, the, 
but he did get fooled and it was a, it was a cruel trick so all afternoon what the vikings have been doing was having andrew van ginkle on on the edge and then dropping him into coverage in the flat and on this occasion what they actually did was bring the inside the middle linebacker um, ivan, pace uh, jr. ivan pace jr around on a curl route to go and cover the flat which allowed Van Ginkel to actually rush on that angle. And that's what got Jones. They'd, they'd set him up for it on three players, plays previously, like running the same system on that side. So he genuinely thought that Christmas had come early and he was going to get the completion to the flat, uh, beating um, Van Ginkel as he retreated off into coverage. And then they would have had a run down instead. As he went to play it, he actually found two players in his passing lane instead of none. Um, yeah, I mean, not that. Yeah, that, I mean, it epitomised Daniel Jones for me that play, uh, it, and and you know that stat around it being the you know one point one six seconds for a pick six. Um, there's obviously significant issues with the Giants' offensive line. There's obviously significant issues with the Giants' quarterback. They let Saquon walk to the Eagles uh, in 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 the summer. Uh, which we can come on to in a minute, because obviously that that's another tale of of woe for the Giants fans. Um, but yeah, ultimately, the Giants are going to be cleaning house uh, this summer. They're going to be a new quarterback, a new head coach, and probably a new GM uh, after the Saquon thing that we all saw on Hard Knocks. So uh, it's going to be a completely fresh start. So. Don't worry, Liam. Only uh, 17 games of the season left to go, and you have uh, I think we should left. stick a counter somewhere in the corner of this just to just to count down the amount of games I got to deal with Daniel Jones with. Um, look, let's let's focus in on the Vikings a little bit. Um, did anything surprise either of you, Dave or Ollie, about the the Vikings' performance in a positive way? Did you see something that you thought that you weren't expecting? Yeah, so for me, it was uh, clock management and the, establishing the run game. Now, I know we were trying to improve on the run game, which has been really weak the past two, three seasons. Basically, since Dalvin Cook used to be good from when he, when he was half decent. Uh, you know, I know we joke about, you know, Jim and Dave talking about Aaron Jones last week, but he got 94 yards and a touchdown. But he, he was playing... Yeah, and, and he was playing with Ty Chandler as well. They made a nice one-two punch uh, in the backfield, and it was really effective. It was just, the difference was, when Madison would lose yards when he shouldn't, when <laughs> Aaron Jones would do the opposite, he would win yards when he shouldn't, and it just, it made it, instead of being third and 11, it would be third and five, and something more manageable circumstance. And... You know, by the time the second half came, a lot of people talking about Sam Darnold not having, you know, as many passes and completions. But that was because we mainly ran the ball. We were just getting the clock down because we didn't really have to pass. There was no point taking the risk for a lot of it. I thought it was really well uh, managed by Kevin O'Connell and Brian Flores. But also, the main surprising thing is we won by, you know, three touchdowns, three scores, which the Vikings don't do. We always win by one score. We could actually relax in the fourth quarter for once. And we have played rubbish teams. I mean, I know the Giants are rubbish, but before we've played rubbish teams, it's not been like that. So that those were the main surprising things, the run game and being comfortable in the fourth quarter. I think um, the, the thing it brought home for me more than anything, and this is without meaning to take shots, but like... Have a look at what happened in Atlanta last night. Well, what what it brought home to me is where you have a team which is a little bit less hamstrung by having an overpaid quarterback. You you can you can have depth. Like last night, we had uh, Pat Jones the second get two sacks, which he's fifth choice in in our in our outside linebacker room. Um, he's behind Dallas Turner's first round draft pick who got a sack as well. Van Ginkle's the starter. Um, he got a sack and an interception. Um, and then there's uh, Grenard, who the guy we signed from the Texans. He basically caused so much havoc, so much pressure. Didn't actually get the sack, but our, our front seven is is weirdly looking like. Decent, admittedly, it was against Daniel Jones and we were able to tee off on him because we had a lead. Um, but more, more than anything for me, it was just 
a relief. Like I didn't even take any joy in it. It finally felt like football was back in Minnesota, and I think like Falcons fans currently know exactly what I'm talking about because Kirk. You made my day more of a Vikings winning this, mate. <laughs> you, look, you look so good. You're going to get Michael Penix Jr. put in within three weeks. You can't actually go and take the ball on the centre anymore because you've got a damaged Achilles, which means you can't do uh, play action, which means you're not effective as a QB. So, yeah, I mean, for, for me, like, much as I, I talk joy in the Vikings, um, I, I kind of had that moment of just, the German word is schadenfreude, joy in the dismay and the, the, the misfortune of others. I, I had that, and and like I I can only apologise to Falcons fans because you don't deserve it, and I feel bad for you. But at the same time, at least you took you, you, you at least you took Phoenix number eight. That's going to look like a genius move in the long run. I think a lot of credit needs to go to the coaching staff at the Vikings. To be honest, I think O'Connell called an incredible uh, offensive game, and Flores. Uh, called an incredible defensive game. Uh, I didn't see much special teams because I don't think you punted very often, uh, to be honest. But what was what was there was there. Um, and I think it's important to note that if something did go... I mean, I, I don't want to doom and gloom it, but if something did go horribly wrong this season from an offensive perspective and you, did, you, you, know, you lose 12 games or whatever, you've got Flores in-house, who would, for me, would be your next step up in a head coaching role. He's got the experience... And the, the the work that he's done with that Minnesota defense in in a season and one game or whatever it is now is quite incredible. To be honest with you, it was always you know you're always a Kirk Cousins offensive led team with Justin Jefferson and then Addison and so on and so forth. But now to be sitting there saying yeah we've got a really solid front seven, still need a bit of work on the back end in the in the defensive backs room. But I mean you've got a good safety, you've got a good safety room. A couple of cornerbacks wouldn't go amiss. Uh, you've got money to spend in the off season at the end, uh, so I think. You now, while well, I don't think you'll be competing uh, properly, the, it, 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 not in the proper mix of it, you know, in the last, you know, divisional round, etc. Uh, I think you know you look good, uh, and it pains me to say it because my team did not. Look, just to round off the <laughs> Giants Vikings chat, I thought I'd leave you with this, which is just um, just a an idea of how bad the Giants actually are, just to make sure that everybody is aware. This clip, which I'm going to bring in now, uh, just goes to show how bad Daniel Jones actually is, OK? So that is the end zone. And Daniel Jones decides that throwing into double coverage here is the right decision, OK? And when you wind this back, I want you to look at Daniel Jones's head and see whether he reads anything other than that one read and the answer to the question is he does not he sees that one read and decides to throw into double coverage here and of course it ends up not achieving what he wants it to achieve that, that was that was fourth down as well wasn't it I'm is pretty sure. absolutely dreadful for another pick so and, and it's I, interesting I think... you, you brought that clip up because what you've actually captured there as well is the 35th interception of Hitman Harrison Phillips' uh, Hitman Harrison Smith's career. And come on, Hitman. That's like, is it 14th year in the league with an interception there? I mean, that is that is gift wrap, though. Like, that, yeah. that is with yeah, a bomb awful, and delivered. And like, oh, yeah, no, just chuck this into double coverage. So, essentially, the, the, the thing to take away from this is congratulations to the Vikings. You were really, really good. But we do just have to qualify it with the fact that the Giants were absolutely dreadful. Absolutely dreadful. And if you can keep it within a score either way against the 49ers next weekend, we'll know that you've actually arrived, won't we? Yeah. I agree. Um, I, I, I think one thing. Uh, no, we haven't arrived. Our QB sitting on our bench with 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 a torn meniscus. This year is still a building year for the Vikings. It's just we're not going to be as bad as many people thought. That's purely and simply it. We might scrape the playoffs because of circumstances within the division. Caleb's going to be horrible, horrible. We'll get onto him in a minute. Um, and then Jordan Love. I know it says two to six weeks. 
I've never seen a knee pop out sideways and then for them to claim <laughs> it's a two-week injury. Um, so I'm intrigued to see if that is a two- to six-week injury. The only QB who's ever sort of fooled me where I saw his knee pop and he was back playing the next week is Patrick Mahomes, who did it, I think, in his second season when trying to go for a quarterback sneak. He, his knee yep. dislocated and he was playing again the following week. So um, Jordan Love... Be the Black Knight from, from Monty Python. Come back, tis but a scratch. Love to see you in week three, because it'll probably be too soon. Here at Utter Punts, we love watching the NFL with friends. And in our opinion, there's no better place to grab a bite to eat and watch the NFL than Beer Keller in Manchester. Whether you're grabbing a bratwurst or smashing through some wings, there's loads of HD screens and a superb choice of drinks behind the bar too. Most importantly for us though, the people are brilliant, like-minded NFL fans who want to enjoy the game and have a laugh. It's definitely one of the best venues to watch your favourite team in. Shall we move on to the Bears next? Because I think that was probably the next big talking point from the weekend, wasn't it? I think all eyes were on Caleb Williams going into that game and wow, what a dreadful first half he had, Jim. Uh, yeah, he was horrible. Um, and me and Dave have called this uh, all off season long. I mean, you can't draw um, you know huge conclusions from the first week, um, but in the famous words of some NFL players, that he he was exactly who we thought he was going to be, um, and that's what he did. Uh, I think it was what, did he have seven yards of offense in the first half or something along those lines? It was it was something disgraceful uh, like that. I mean, look the Bears. The Bears um, massively compensated for that with their defense and special teams, so we can't take anything away from that. But you, you know, it's a bit. I'd be a little bit worried if this continues. That if the Bears have to win in spite of their quarterback being in that situation, myself with the Browns, um, you know, having to win without your quarterback is not a good place to be. Uh, they haven't been able to do that over the last few years with Justin Fields. Um, and, and we all saw him get shipped out for a sixth round pick to the Steelers. Um, I don't think we'll be seeing Caleb Williams shipped out for a sixth round pick uh, anytime soon. But at the same time, the game just looked far too fast for him. Uh, they kept him in the pocket, which is not what not where he wanted to be. Um, and ultimately, yeah, it's just uh, it was painful to watch. Uh, it looked like the first preseason game. To be perfectly honest, it looked like he'd never taken a snap under centre before uh, and it was just it was just bad I, I, um, in, in actual games he'd taken one in the pre-season from under centre and then I wow. put him out there and asked him to play under centre the thing was as um, well it's not like he was playing like a team of any quality they were playing the Titans who in my opinion are probably the third worst team in football um, you know again they, they, they won yesterday because Will Levis is not the sharpest tool in the box when it comes to getting rid of the football. So uh, it was quite fortunate. He's the first number one overall pick to win in... What, 20 about, years. 20 years or something, which is crazy considering I think he put up a total of 130, 130 yards passing or something along those lines. Or it might have been 130 yards of total offence. Uh, concerning for Bears fans, but that defence and that special teams looks mean. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've I. Got, um, sorry, I've got a, I've just a little clip before we go any further, just sort of highlighting um, exactly what exactly what we've just been talking about about Caleb Williams. I, I'll just I'll share the screen again so you can see exactly what we're talking about here. So this is um, from uh, the NFL on X, and they decide here just to show him getting flushed from the pocket and him trying to scramble backwards in the in the NFL like he was trying to do. Uh, in the college game, and you can just see it, it's meat and drink. It, 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 it's too easy for for anybody. Once you manage to flush him out of the pocket like that, he can't scramble. He just does not have the pace that that he probably had when he was playing in the college game. Not anymore. That is uh, almost. Who were the Titans uh, pass rushers as well? Is the question I'd ask because I can't Simmons. name. Simandry. So Jeffrey Simmons is their three technique, and Harold Landry is their primary pass rusher. Um, is there other one? They don't have, like, well, they do, but there's no one kind of who leaps out at me as a name that I would call. That's what I'm saying. This is a case in point here. So, you know, he wasn't playing someone like Miles Garrett or Mika Parsons or 
uh, Joey or Nick Bosa or TJ Watt or whichever. He was playing Jeff- Jeffrey Simmons coming up the gut. Uh, he was playing ha- a 32-year-old Harold Landry off the one edge. And, you know, you take your pick of whoever it was on the other edge. So it's not like he was playing against the top, a top D-line going after him. Uh, and yet he made the Titans look quite competent. Uh, which is, is 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 a bit of an achievement in itself because I, I th- like I said they're the third worst team in football for me. I know I I think if you're comparing it to the other quarterback who started as a rookie because uh, Drake May was on the bench, McCarthy's um, injured. You've got Bo Nix as well, but I'm talking in the top, you know, top five. You've got uh, Jaden Daniels, who they came against the Buccaneers. Their last I think it was thirty-seven uh, twenty. The Bucks beat them. But, you know, watching that game, Daniels had his moments a lot more than Caleb Williams. I think in a Washington Commanders team that was pretty poor last year, he got a rushing touchdown, a passing touchdown. I think, you know, he played relatively well. Of course, he had poor moments, otherwise they would have been closer in the game with the Bucks. But he showed more promise, I think, for the long-term development than Caleb did Uh, with Less weapons, arguably, as well in that offense. I mean, they've got Austin Eckler, Austin Eckler, Luke McCaffrey, and Terry McLaurin. But then you look at the Bears' weapons. You know, DeAndre Swift, Keenan Allen, Roma Dunze. They've, you know, they've got much better players, I'd say. And Caleb looked poor. And the Buccaneers as well. You know, they won their wild card game against Philadelphia in the playoffs last year. They're a good, well-drilled team. With a great Michael Mayfield was dealing yesterday as well. Like he he was absolutely dealing. Uh, to be Four honest, Fort Stanford I, game. Yeah, it hurt me. It hurt me a little bit having to watch my load of crap. But um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Baker was dealing. Um, but Caleb Williams, you know, I'm hoping that me and Dave are in a position to say I told you so. Um, and after one week, I'm feeling fairly confident in that I told you so. Uh, in if, that, I told this, you might, so, <clears throat> this might be a stupid question and ap- apologies if it is how much of that bad performance is first actual snaps in the NFL and how much of it is a skill gap issue I'll, I'll take this one if, yeah, I think um, so he's been asked to do things in the pros that he wasn't asked to do in college and for some reason those assessing the, the draft last year didn't actually seem to pay any attention to the fact that he wasn't asked to do NFL things. What he was capable of doing was being really effective. He reminded a lot of people of Patrick Mahomes when he was coming out of college. But if, if you remember, Patrick Mahomes didn't start his first year. He sat for a year behind Alex Smith, who was a very savvy veteran quarterback, who basically was in a position where he was able to um, teach him how to prepare for a game. So there was never any pressure on Mahomes that first year. What you've got with Caleb, he's a very young man who didn't really display um, what I would call emotional intelligence in college. Um, And as a result, he's very much in the need of mentors. And we discussed it last week. It looked like Keenan Allen was kind of like on hard knocks, was attempting to help him out, talk to him about what he needed to be looking for, that kind of thing. And Caleb didn't seem that receptive to it. And then this week, Keenan Allen like basically dropped the one possible touchdown pass that uh, Caleb attempted to throw. Hopefully they can both sort of get on the same page because for me, Keenan Allen is exactly what Caleb Williams will need in order to learn how to play in the NFL. The problem is he doesn't have that in his coaching staff. So they're set up with Matt Eberflus, who's uh, a defensively a very, very good coach. They've brought in a young rookie quarterback you look at their QB room and who's in there. Well, the one experienced QB they had was Brett Ripien, um, who is not exactly someone who lights the world up. But then they cut Brett Ripien and the Vikings took him into their squad. And as a result, now you've got a situation where there isn't really a backup. There's no second like plan B for, for Chicago. They're going to have to put this kid out there and... He's facing a death row of, of pass rushers um, without actually having been given what I would deem to be adequate time to prepare, adequate coaching, or indeed a college career which lent itself towards making him ready. What he had was raw talent. And 
that raw talent let him down at the college level against decent defences and then he's only going to face decent defences in, 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 the, in the NFL. I mean, like, we've, we've all been banging on about how bad the Giants are. They still have Dexter Lawrence, one of the best three techniques in the league now that Aaron Donald's gone, possibly the best, only really Chandler Jones up there with him, I think, off the top of my head. Um, but they still have uh, Thibodeau, who I think is a, a good pass rusher. Brian Burns, who they signed for, for massive money. That, that defense will destroy quarterbacks who don't understand what it is that they're trying to do. And I think that Caleb is in a, a, a thankless position. Having said all of that, he's one and oh, he's a QB. QB wins, Caleb. Don't you bother training, mate. You carry on doing exactly what you're doing. You listen to those coaches. Don't try to improve, my man. You be you. The thing is, as well, you look at them, they've got a first year offensive coordinator in Shane Waldron. Did he help out Caleb Williams yesterday? Probably not with the play calling, to be honest with you. Um, Caleb doesn't, uh, he's from the UFC, he's from USC. Uh, we discussed this on off-season episodes. There, you know, someone named me the last successful USC quarterback in, 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 in the NFL. You know, we've got such great names as Mark Sanchez, Matt Barkley, people like that. To, to, uh, Sam Darnold is, they, is the They one. retired his shirt. USC retired Caleb Williams jersey number. Oh, that's low. That's oh. low. That's low rent. That is. That's like a team. Like that's like a football team retiring a player's shirt after he's left them when he's eighteen and gone to Germany. That is. So. Oh, and then, then long that's, term, that's being proven to be genius. Because I tell you yeah, what, we haven't retired. We haven't retired his shirt. shirt then. We haven't. Old. We haven't retired his shirt. What we did was we put his shirt on hold. He'll be back in a few years. And then you like, will get to see him in the Premier League with the only team he'll play for in the Premier League because he is a man of honour, a man of a moral compass, a man of integrity. We're talking Jude uh, Bellingham for those that don't know because these two are glory hunters. Glory hunters. <laughs> I guarantee you a few years at Real Madrid will knock all of that righteousness right out of him. He'll be able to be a, a full mercenary by the time he leaves Madrid, let me tell you. Uh, right, when it comes to blues soccer. on a free for 500 quid a week. <laughs> enough <laughs> soccer, more football. Um, shall we move it on, boys? Shall we go to the next talking point? Have we, are we all done with that one? Shall we move it on to... I've got the one. Talking point that, uh, one. Have you got one? I, I was going to talk about Jim and the Browns. But it's up to you whether you want to go Browns first or your talking point. I just wanted to see Jim like smile a bit instead of being sad. So <laughs> I was just I was just because okay. because we're talking about uh, young quarterbacks. You know, we talked about Caleb a bit on Bryce Young and well, Daniel Jones isn't young, but he's crap. In terms of good, CJ <laughs> CJ Stroud and Anthony Richardson. Both balled out yesterday in a very close game, uh, divisional game, Texans and Colts. Richardson looked really good on his uh, return back from injury. I was delighted with that as well, mate. You, you're quite right. Yeah, dig a little more there because he was brilliant. Like, he, I think it was like a 56, 66-yard pass. He got into the end zone, scrambled in for a touchdown. CJ Stroud, you know, we were talking about last week, is, you know, soft, sophomore year, he may... Uh, not do as well because that's kind of a thing in the NFL, but he looked just as good. Uh, Stefan Diggs getting two touchdowns on his uh, debut for the Texans. It looks like that division, the AFC South, which was probably the worst division in football a few years ago, is looking positive for the future. You've also got the Jags with Trevor Lawrence. There's mixed opinions on him, but you know he's still in a close game with Miami. It's only Tennessee really who don't have their franchise quarterback to speak in that division. I just wanted to like bring up that I thought Richardson was brilliant, and it is more positive having more franchise quarterbacks that are talented in the league. I and agree. It looks exciting. I agree, and from what I saw yesterday, I mean, look, I don't think the Colts are a, a complete side. I think they're la they're lacking uh, in, on their defensive side of the ball, um, but what? But you know. Um, Stroud did well. Uh, Stroud did what Stroud did last year. He looked uh, fluid. He looked functional. He spread the ball around. Uh, you know, he was clinical in the red zone. So all of those things were positive to see because obviously we discussed the potential sophomore slump. We didn't see any elements of that yesterday. I personally was expecting the Texans to, to beat the, the Colts by probably two scores. 
Um, so it was a lot closer than I thought it was going to be. Uh, Richardson surprised me a little bit at quarterback. Uh, watched him when he was at college, was quite one flavour in that sense. Just hammer it as hard as you can, regardless of how far away the receiver is. Um, one thing I did see that made me smile but made me cringe was his uh, rushing touchdown in the fourth quarter. And I just thought to myself, this is how you got knocked out uh, for the season last season by doing this and putting your shoulder down and fighting for those extra yards. Um, but it worked for him. I just uh, it just makes me nervous, especially with a with a quarterback who coming off shoulder injuries, putting their shoulder down and fighting for that. So, but overall, very entertaining game. Yeah. I felt very similar about Lamar this week as well. I thought there was an awful lot of him taking chances that I wasn't anticipating him taking so early in the season. We'll see how that goes for both of them. So Richardson went 9 for 19, 212 yards, two touchdowns and an interception. Um, helped out, I think, by having Jonathan Taylor back and fit. So 16 carries for him over the course, which, you know, not an awful lot of yardage, but helpful to have somebody of that quality alongside him. And on the other side of the ball, CJ Stroud, 24 for 32, 234 yards and a couple of touchdowns as well. Helped out ably by Joe Mixon, who we mentioned, didn't we, last week when we were doing our um, when we were doing our draft and preview. So interesting that they've kind of got the quarterback running back thing going on on uh, at both the Colts and the Texans this season. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mixon had a fantastic uh, debut. Uh, much better than I anticipated, actually. You know, a lot of running backs moved um, in the off-season, Aaron Jones, Josh Jacobs, Saquon Barkley, Joe Mixon. He had arguably the best start of any of them other than Saquon, but I don't want to keep upsetting you, Liam, so we'll let, we'll let that slide. But he, he played really well for the Texans. And, and the weapons they've added, you know, we did talk about it in the opening opening episode, but, you know, they were already very good last year, and they've only added players of quality, Joe Mixon, Stefan Diggs, Daniil Hunter... And as they all get to know each other better, as they work on their schemes, look through footage, you know, look through film, see what they can improve, they're only going to get better. Um, like Jim said, I thought they'd win by a bit more against the Colts, but the Colts were a good team last year as well, and they've got they've got Richardson back, and Jonathan Taylor starting finally. They're a well drilled, solid team. Probably maybe a wild card team, or just about missing out on the playoffs. Uh, you know, Mixon was brilliant. I think the Texans are going to be exciting this year. I don't know if they'll recreate what they did last year, but for the future, I think they're in that window that other teams have jumped out of. In my opinion, despite their win, Bills, in the long term, no. I was shocked at Mixon, to be honest. I thought he was finished. Um, he hasn't done anything for the Bengals for probably two years now. Uh, and that's so much so that they were going to release him until they traded him for a seventh round pick to the Texans. So to get that kind of return on a seventh round pick and just the balance it brought to the offense, it didn't put CJ Stroud in, in obvious passing situations all the time. Uh, running out of the shotgun was there. So, uh, yeah, all in all, great. It, it was, it, it looked, the Texans investments have paid up. It looked like they've paid off in that first game. Colts output form expectations. Um, just hope Anthony Richardson, both of his shoulders stay on this year. Just um, just briefly on Joe Mixon, 30 carries, 159 yards and a touchdown. But I think the most impressive thing was the average yards per carry. So he went at 5.3. And as we all know, anything over five in, in a game of, of American football is pretty good going, certainly at that level. So see whether he can keep it up because injuries have been an issue for him, haven't they? Yeah, and I mean, he's been running beyond the Bengals' offensive line for the last few years, which hasn't done him any favours. Um, but I just didn't think he had the legs anymore, to be honest. And then he rips off a 150 and three TD game, so you yeah. can't, you can't, you can't argue with that. To be fair to it, him, so my apologies, Joe. Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard getting touchdowns as well was like flashes from the past. And, and Alexander Madison. I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Madison, I mean, like Matt Madison did not look thirty yards out. I mean, it's clear that he can't be the, uh, you know, you can't ask him to run 25 times a game. It's not going to do him any favours, but he looked lighter and he looked like he actually had an ability to, to, to do a jump cut. So I'm, I'm so pleased for him because it was a shame that he just seemed that his career was, was done after last year with the Vikings. Um, 
But yeah, he he looked great. Like uh, I know the Raiders lost, but I hope he does well. I hope, quite, I hope he does really quite well. Quite questionable decision from um, from Antonio there, but at the same time, like where he chose to punt rather than go for it on fourth and one. Um, but at the same time, the Raiders looked good as well. It was that was a good game in its own right. I don't know if you spotted it. It was a, a little bit. I say good game. It was an awful game, but I just like seeing Jim Harbour back in the league. Got well tasty towards the end as well. There was a, there was a massive punch up at the uh, after one of the after one of the players uh, that was separated four times, and they just kept going back for more, which always makes me smile. To be honest with you, and it will make Roger Goodell smile as well with the amount of fines he's going to hand out for that. So. <laughs> fines, yes, but but no one got kicked out of the game. It was given which as is incredible because um, there was about it was nine. Given as offsetting penalties, <laughs> and the, the, the main guy who was the number one um, for for the Raiders who just wouldn't let it go. He wasn't even mentioned. No. Like, so, but he's getting a he's getting a big fine, big fine, big fine for it. I, I love it. Bring it back, old school. Bench clearances, that's what we need. Um, Did you yeah. see the fans? Sorry. The, 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 the fans, the Chargers and Raiders fans started fighting after that in the crowd. And this one guy went up to the other one. Raiders fan took his T-shirt off for some reason, went to attack the guy. The Chargers fan just got him in a headlock, held him there, wasn't choking him or hurt, just held him and started grinning at the cameras as they started <laughs> filming it. That is uh, that, that's what we need. We need more of it, more of it. Less fines, more punch-ups, please. If you're anything like us at Utter Punts, we love the fantasy games surrounding the NFL, but sometimes they're a bit too focused on their American audiences. That's why we were blown away when the Fantasy Game Day app rolled into town. A weekly fantasy game with player values in pounds, totally dedicated to the NFL's UK audience. There's insights and analysis and plenty of opportunity to compete with your friends but the best bit, weekly cash prizes. Use code PUNTS when you sign up for a free entry after you play your first week. Right, let's move it on, shall we? Sorry, Jim, the time has come, mate, um, to talk about the Browns. If we must. Uh, before we do talk about the Browns, I just want to note that it was Tom Brady's uh, broadcast debut uh, for that Browns how, Dallas Cowboys game. How did you think he got on? I thought it was horrible. Um, I, I think his voice was irritating. Uh, I thought Tony Romo is is leagues ahead. Uh, so of, I, of Tom I Brady. have no bias in this whatsoever, but I <laughs> thought Tom did a remarkably great job. In fact, right. like, I, 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 I remember just sitting there listening to Tom's insightful commentary and the excuses he was making for the players being absolutely awful uh, and thinking to myself, Tom, you're a legend. Don't let anyone ever feel they say otherwise, especially not bitter little Villa fans. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> that's why I, 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 I might be meeting Tom next week, so I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> no, it's probably wise that for the sake of your job that you say nothing at all. I think just, uh, and this is, this is across the piece in broadcasting, and, and bearing in mind that this is my job and this is what I do, um, just because you've been an excellent player of whatever sport it is that you do does not make you immediately a brilliant player communicator of that game and I think there is room for Tom Brady in terms of broadcasting on the NFL but he needs to treat it the same way that he treated his NFL career and that is the hard yards, the work that goes behind the scenes, the preparation the understanding, the, the listening to other great broadcasters and understanding what makes them good communicators on, on broadcasts like that and I think that if he manages to get a grip of it he's got the potential to be right up there but just look at the work that Romo does yeah no, and that's it I mean it's his first game so you can't go too hard on him to be fair uh, there were elements of uh, uh, some of some of the some of the insight that he, I found his insight far more valuable than his actual commentary on the game so what's going through the quarterback's head what's going you know what 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 part do the tight ends play in in an offense and things like that? So I think there were saving graces to it. I think there were interesting tidbits along the line. I just think from a play by play perspective, it just wasn't what um, you know. Obviously, it wasn't the play by players the color. I think so. It wasn't what uh, he's not. He wasn't Tony Romo. 
Um, but at the same time, like you say, first week, room to improve. Um, but it, yeah, it was okay. And what I would say is a lot better than the Sky Sports pundits, um, who, so, who absolutely drive me insane, to be perfectly frank. I don't even want to talk about them. But what I will say about Tony Romo is it's kind of ironic that we're actually like bigging up his work, bearing in mind he nearly got fired this off season for not having been doing his homework recently. That was so, that was not this off season, <laughs> it was last off season, wasn't it? Um, was, and yeah, was and there was talk of a, of a big mix up this year as well. I like Tony Romo though because he makes me smile and he comes across as um, like almost like a mate who's watching it, the game, as but, opposed to someone trying to impress. Which I love how he accurately calls the players. So yeah. he'll say, "This is a run. This is a you know. This is a play action. This is a, before and he knows, it's happened. Yeah, yeah. before oh, it's yeah. happened. Just from the alignment of the O line or the running back. I try and do that on." I try and do that every play, and then I get like one in every ten. But they're the ones I tell people about. Yeah, I am. Um, I value with Tony Romo is that if there's a flag on the play, he will call what the penalty is before anybody else. And not only that, is he'll tell you who it was. So it, as as he's as he's doing the color commentary, he'll go watch the top of the screen on the replay. That's where, that's where the flags come in, and 99 times out of 100. He's he's called it. There was, um, yeah, he's just, he's just brilliant at it, and that it helps out when you're not a died in the wool lifelong NFL fan. When you're fairly new to it, like I am, that's really handy to have somebody that is pointing you in the right direction to try and give you a bit of um, a bit of a steer as to what's going on. What, uh, Jim, may I say? So, sorry, Liam, mate. What, what's sorry. your favourite bit of NFL commentary? Is there anything that stands out in your head as something that you've heard? And it's just like that commentary will stand the test of time, even if the commentator didn't mean it to. Like the example for me was when uh, Randy Moss um, scored a touchdown at Green Bay after all the Green Bay fans had been mooning the Vikings coach on the way in. And he basically mimed mooning the big Green Bay fans. And Joe Buck delivered the line, oh, what is it? That, that is absolutely heinous. I've never seen the light. Like, he was so disgusted in that moment. I can't even remember the words. I remember how reviled he was in the moment. And, like, it's a, just a classic bit of commentary for me. I, I, the, the genuine emotion of it. I should bear in mind that I've done a really good job of misdirect on talking about the Browns. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to... <laughs> I don't want to drag it out much longer. So, from a commentary perspective, I, I, if I watch the full game, because if we're like, like yesterday and we're 17 points, 20 points down uh, just after half time, I, I normally bin it off. So, I probably don't get that many one line zingers in Brank's games, uh, especially when you're watching Deshaun play. So, with that, I will move on to the, the Browns uh, and how bad that was yesterday. Um, in short, it was a, not far short of a disaster. Um, it where you could see it from the first offensive series with the Browns, where uh, they sacked Dak Prescott for a huge loss uh, and forced them into a punt. Uh, we returned the punt to the 40-yard line. Uh, I think we gained about four yards of offense on that first offensive series. Um, it's the same old, same old Deshaun, unfortunately. Throws too high, throws too low, panics in the pocket, misses open receivers. Uh, just isn't what we paid for uh, in any way, shape or form. Um, to the point where I messaged Dave yesterday saying, can your brother play quarterback for us, please? Uh, to which he only agreed if he could get the massages that Deshaun gets. Um, so that's an interesting one in itself, which we'll probably leave uh, for, for offline chat. But yeah, all in all, um, offensive phase of the game, terrible. Um, Amari Cooper, two, nine targets, two catches, 16 yards. Um, Elijah Moore dropped a couple. David Njoku dropped a couple and has now got a high ankle sprain and looks like he's going to be out for between six to eight weeks. Uh, we didn't bring any tight ends in in the offseason, so there goes our favoured offensive jumbo approach for the run game uh, when Nick Chubb comes back. So... Another disaster there. Uh, the offensive line, two top offensive tackles out in Conklin and Willis. Uh, one Jones took a while to get going after a couple of first uh, full start penalties, but was generally solid on the right. Hudson is uh, not a NFL quality left tackle. 
uh, and the offensive line was generally terrorised by the uh, Cowboys the entire game. I think I read this morning there were 17 quarterback pressures uh, yesterday, uh, as well as six sacks. So that's that's the equivalent of being under siege. Uh, and when you've got your offensive, you sent your you know your middle of your offensive line, uh, you've got Petonio on 15 million, Wyatt Teller on 15 million, and Posich on 10 million. Uh, to, to to not be helping out and not chipping uh, Mika Parsons regularly on pass blocks was criminal, and we paid the price for it. Um, you know, it was Deshaun Watson's. There's no way to sugarcoat it. Was his fault. He was he was really bad. We couldn't get a running game going. Uh, we couldn't get a passing game going. I think we had 36 yards of offense in the first half. Um, we'd completed one first down uh, in in the first half. So there's no way to sugarcoat that, and uh, the Browns are. You, 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 I fear for them against the Jaguars next week because uh, it, it has to. It can't get any worse than that. It has to be better. It felt like watching a Hugh Jackson Browns team. I I know we joke uh, like between each other, obviously about the Vikings, Browns, Giants. We're all like all our teams are different, other than me and Dave. But I do genuinely feel sorry for the Browns because it. it it feels like the pieces of the puzzle are there, but just not at the same time. Like first of all, Chubb's out since last season, which is horrible because he is an elite running back, and he will come back this season. And I really like Kevin Stefanski as a head coach. I think he's really good. What he did last season with four different quarterbacks, getting them to the playoffs with eleven wins, uh, you know, remarkable. Your defense is elite, which is the only reason <coughs> you had probably any points on the board by the end is because they somewhat kept you in it in a way but obviously when the defense is on all the time you get tired if offense can't yep. produce it needs to be an even amount of production and the Browns showed last season that they don't even need an elite quarterback to be competitive they need a competent one in Joe Flacco I mean Joe Flacco is a Super Bowl winner but by the time he's played for Cleveland he's what 38 yep. you know what I mean if you stick pretty much any quarterback in the well, any competent mid quarterback, you put Dak I'm Prescott. I qualified that to say not Daniel Jones, basically. Yeah, like, yeah. If you put, if you put a Dak Prescott, a Kirk Cousins, these kind of uh, two attack of Ilo, these kind of not elite, elite, but you know decent, well paid quarterbacks in the Browns would be a playoff wild card winning team. But Deshaun Watson, man, the money you guys gave him, it was it's. You can't justify it. <laughs> it's awful. He looked terrible. He just can't control the it. The money's an issue. The three first round picks obviously massively uh, detriment your team building strategy. But having said that, from a bra- from a, everything else, we've got a really we've got a good wide receiver room. Uh, we've got a good running back room with Chubb. It's average without Chubb. Jerome Ford's not terrible. Uh, mm-hmm. Offensive line generally pretty good. Um, to be honest. David and Joku, pro bowler last year, tight end, so fine. Defence, as you mentioned, pretty, you know, close to elite. Into, you know, probably a top five defence again this year, I would expect from what I saw yesterday. Um, that the, 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 the Deshaun Watson issue is uh, a huge problem. Uh, they've obviously kicked some of that signing bonus down the road, so it now costs us £170 million if we wanted to cut ties after this season. Uh, in in dead cap money, whether you split that over one or two years, um, so that's the that's the pain here. Um, I mean, you can still do it if you're drafting a rookie quarterback. I would add that, um, but at the same time, it, we Deshaun Watson is the Browns' quarterback for this year and next year as an absolute bare minimum. Uh, I would suggest, and the way that it's going, um, you know, he was he was being heavily booed. Uh, halfway through the second quarter yesterday, because his average yards per attempt were four, were just over four, um, and that's not what you're paying uh, 46 million dollars a year for a quarterback uh, to deliver for you. That being said, uh, the Cowboys uh, defense looked elite. Their defense was incredible yesterday. That Prescott had a good first half and didn't do anything in the second half. Uh, we've already alluded to uh, Ezekiel Elliott getting in the end zone, so it felt like uh, t- 2019 all over again. So, yeah, I mean, all in all, uh, and obviously the special teams punt return uh, touchdown, which almost made me throw my remote control through the TV. 
uh, to be honest. So, yeah, look, it, it, it's a bad day at the office for the Browns. Uh, I'm concerned that Deshaun Watson could well end up costing Stefanski and or Andrew Berry his job. Um, because when you trade three first-round picks and give someone $230 million and they f- consistently fail, uh, someone's going to pay for that. Uh, you know, not literally, but figuratively. Um, and while we have signed them to new contracts, if the season goes tits up this year, uh, then then someone's going to pay the price for that. And it can't be Deshaun Watson because of that. Hundred, it's going to cost 170 million. So uh, horrible. It was a horrible offensive game plan. Um, defense looked like they'd checked out uh, after you know halfway through the third quarter. To be honest, so. Pretty demoralising day, not something I'm not unused to being a Browns fan. We have won the last two uh, opening day games, uh, which which gives you a bit of false hope. Uh, but before that, we hadn't won an opening day game for 19 years. So uh, we've just started a streak again. So let's see how it goes next week against the Jags. And I, I do feel that most, um, most teams in the NFL would snap Stefanski up as a head coach as well. I think it would be, oh, yeah. it would be horrible for him to get fired. He's one coach of the year, two out of four years or whatever it is. I, I, think, coach of the year. I mean, he used to be a, uh, on the Vikings and a lot of people were thinking, you know, Zimmer should have been fired and he should have been promoted to head coach. Obviously things have worked out how they are and I'm, personally ha- very happy with Kevin O'Connell and Brian Flores but there are a lot of teams out there that do need a quality head coach and I think Stefanski is that and it shouldn't really cost him his job because I think it's one of them I, I don't think that the Sean Watson thing is on him I'm not I'm an outsider looking in, in in terms of the Browns but you know what he did last year what he's done in previous years I think he's a very good head coach and I think it would be a shame if that whole situation gets ends up getting him fired I hope it doesn't. Um, interesting tidbit, who was the Dallas Cowboys defensive coordinator yesterday? I was going to come to that. There's a little bit went on there. Mike Zimmer was the defensive coordinator for Dallas. And not only that, he had starting for him one of the players who criticised him when he left the Vikings in Eric Kendricks. And finally, Eric Kendricks has made things good with Daddy by uh, getting that little that, that pick that turned things around. Because it was Eric Kendricks who desperately pushed three of his own players out of the way to make sure he got the ball so he could take it back over to Mike and say sorry for all the nasty things he said. Um, who deserved was, them, by the way. He deserved yeah, those yeah. nasty things. Yes, good. and I think in the interview he gave recently about whether or not he deserved all of those nasty things, all he did was give more examples of the fact that he's a bitter little man. Um, and it's a shame because... If you assume that whenever he's been a jerk, he's joking, he's a really quite charming man. The problem is, he was never joking. He was always serious in the things that he said, and people just cut him so much slack. Um, I but wish I'm, I'm he was kind of... joking on how many times he sent Mika Parsons on a pass rush yesterday, because Mate, Jesus with, with those tools, and like just based on scheme and the ability to run X's and O's, his ability to re- review film and work out how to destroy a particular person, the Dallas of possibly saved Mike McCarthy's job there because I think that come come the playoffs Mike Zimmer is a more capable human being than than Dan Quinn of putting things together in a way where you're still going to be coming up surprises even as you're going into the latter stages of the season Quinn's a bit of a one-trick pony I'm I'm intrigued by what Zimmer's going to do he's like and and more than anything I do wish Zimmer well because I genuinely love that guy, and it didn't go wrong until a certain Mr. Cousins turned up, and I felt I felt for Mike all the way through. He was right, but he didn't deal with it in the right way. Yeah. All right, we've got um, a couple of minutes left, really, so let's just talk about some of the other news that came out of the NFL yesterday. Uh, I suppose the biggest one was Dak Prescott's contract, wasn't it? We've already mentioned him in terms of the game, but... Christ alive, that is a monstrous, monstrous contract handed to Dak. What did everybody think about it? Um, I'll take this one straight away. The fact that, because obviously when Dak got the contract, he's the highest paid NFL player ever now. $60 million a year, which uh, 
on a $240 million contract, which puts him $5 million ahead of the person in second. I believe there's three players, Trevor Lawrence, Joe Burrow, and someone else. I'm missing there. But the, the thing that was most telling for me is that the top nine quarterbacks, highest-paid quarterbacks paid, does not include Patrick Mahomes on that list. Now, if you want to talk about how you win, I don't think Tom Brady was on the highest-paid quarterbacks list during his era. Dave mentioned it earlier with the Viking. Obviously, Sam Darnold is nowhere near the level of these players. But what I'm saying is, when you have more money to spend on your roster instead of just your quarterback, you can win more stuff. And I think and that's for the long term, the- 28 million cap it this year. The Vikings are off for Kirk Cousins, but we don't have to worry about saving up for next year. And, and I think the Cowboys will be very good this year. You know, they allude, Jim and Dave alluded to it with Mike Zimmer, who is brilliant at the X's and O's for defense. Uh, but in the long term for the Cowboys, having Dak on that much money, I worry for them. <laughs> Especially, what I would say, yeah, I, I don't. Sorry to interrupt. I don't disagree with you. Um, I think. The biggest thing with quarterbacks is trying to get in front of the market, ahead of the market in terms of contracts. And obviously with the way that the salary cap raises every year, um, the Chiefs were saw this coming a mile off and gave Mahomes a 10-year extension uh, after three years in the league. Um, so he got $400 million, uh, over 10 years, which obviously then breaks down to $40 million a season, which now when you consider Dax on 60 uh, it's all old and new money, so it's it's an incre- you know when you start seeing things like that, and if you can get that level of buy-in from your people, obviously not many people are prepared to sign that longer contract because of those values increasing. Um, but yeah, it won't be long until someone beats Dak. Um, I can't think off the top of my head who's probably next in line to get paid. Um, because it's right in a couple of years. CJ Stroud. Yeah, Stroud's, Stroud's going to be Stroud's realistically going to be your next one uh, in 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 all in all likelihood because there seems to be like a two or three year dearth of franchise quarterbacks where no one got one. Kevin uh, obviously, Pickett, the, Malik Willis, that yeah. there, that was that was awful. What was the other one though? Because you're right, there's a year's worth of of of, of contract worthy quarterbacks missing, and I can only think of one complete bust year. No, it's Baker and Co, isn't it? Baker's it's Baker, Baker got paid. Co. He Baker got, got paid, paid by the Bucks. Yeah, he got paid by the Bucks, but he didn't get that that classic like market breaking contract. He was number one that draft. Then Darnold was two or three, and then it, yeah, it, it, it's that draft which actually had and Lamar like, was thirty two. Yeah, and so, Josh and Allen. The, Lamar already got paid. Was was, was Josh Allen in that draft at ten? Yeah, um, Josh Allen got Josh Allen's been I think they've all been paid in that draft. That's what I mean. I think we'll have to look into that for the next one to be honest, so we can talk about uh talk about where those contracts do slot and that two or three year dearth of franchise quarterbacks. But all in all, uh the Dak Prescott deal, uh over the top for me, not showing it he's not showing that he's elite. Uh, didn't deal well with the Browns um adjustments they made at half time yesterday, but ultimately didn't need to because he was twenty points up. Um, we'll see when it when the chips are down and he has to play in a game that really matters as opposed to the first game of the season. Um, but to be five mi- five million ahead of the next one down is a lot. Um, and I mean, especially someone like Joe Burrow, for example. Joe Burrow is a much better quarterback than Dak is. Um, but fair play to him; he got his money. So did CD Lamb. So Jerry Jones has been writing checks in the last week or two uh, to the tune of about three hundred and seventy million. Uh, yeah. That'd be nice, but yeah, crazy. eighty, 80 million dollars signing bonus as well for Dak is being reported, and it's fully guaranteed. That two thirty one, it's fully two thirty one out of two forty is guaranteed. Do Do you think he would have had to give Dak that much money if he'd restructured him two years ago? No, not on no. your life. What and I found Dak will still was be on the little... contract for another three years, right? Yeah. Meant, and it was the tiff that they had, was it last week or the week before, where Jerry Jones says, yeah, I know what Dak is, I haven't seen anything particularly special from him. And Dak coming out and saying, um, I don't really listen to what Jerry Jones says anymore because it doesn't really mean anything to me. So it's an interesting turnaround in 10 days from being in that position to getting 240 with 230 guaranteed. 
Two, and that, so the, the the question that I had here is that that 231 is a million more guaranteed than the next closest one, wasn't it? What was the next closest one? The Sean. The Sean, the Sean the 230. Watson. Now, if I didn't know Jerry Jones the way that I know Jerry Jones, or certainly have understood Jerry Jones, I'd be looking at that and going, oh, yeah, fair enough. But that million pound extra guarantee does feel like a headline grabber rather than a necessity. It's a I was stunned to see CD how much Lamp. it was guaranteed. CD Lamb really wanted to be the leading wide receiver. He held out for a while. I think he's coming just under Jefferson. But the, the whole Jamar Chase thing is caused by him wanting one dollar more than, than Jefferson. And Brand, um, Brandon Ayuk as well. It's been a lot. Of, they're setting a tone for holding out, and it's worrying in the league. We, I think we talked about the, Jamar last week. But yeah. The last position that decided very massively undervalued and um, decided that they'd hold out would not play games. That was running back. It was uh, Le- Le'Veon Bell, and he was never the same after a year away. Never the same. No. <sighs> right. Well, there you go. One more thing to talk about, and that is the Super Bowl halftime show has been confirmed. It is Kendrick Lamar who will be, uh, hope you know, putting on a show at halftime. Which means I think that we can expect a complaint from Drake by the end of the third quarter, can't we? That's how that works. I. That yeah, I hope so, good. because I really like that song, and it makes me laugh every time I listen to it, to be honest with you. So I'm quite looking forward to that. I fear this music reference is completely lost on Dave, uh, to be honest. Uh, and no, Ali, Ali hasn't put his hand up, so maybe it's lost on him too. <laughs> no, I, I, I know about the Drake and Kendrick Lamar thing, but I'm not a fan of Kendrick's music. Um, uh, he was a cameo in a... Much, much better halftime show with what, Snoop, Eminem and Dr. Snoop, Dr. Dre, Eminem. Um, I don't I know. know them. I'm, I'm familiar with their work. Um, trailer Park Boys. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, if it makes people happy, then I'm happy. It was widely well received, but um, that it's certainly one for the kids rather than the older ones among us. Uh, you know, Kendrick's not, not my favourite hip hop artist out there, but you know, it is. Who is your favourite hip hop artist, Liam? Uh, right now, mm. probably J. Cole. And, and and if Dan were here, he'd be able to have a whole conversation with you about that. Yeah, Dan and I would be <laughs> fully, fully nuts deep in the hip hop conversation, definitely. Um, uh, but, but you know, you know, place your I audience didn't even realise that Joe Joe Cole did hip hop. I only knew Not him Joe as Joe uh... Cole, you melon. Oh, the Chelsea player. Jesus yeah, it's quality, God. really good. So that that one that's that goal one that's scored against Sweden. London or whatever it is, that's Joe Cole, isn't it? Oh, it was in Peaky oh. Blinders as well. Yeah, yeah I know yeah, that yeah. Joe. Is it him who does hip hop? Yeah, we're so white, it's ridiculous. When are they going to get Frank Sinatra for the halftime show? <laughs> ah, <laughs> old blue eyes. <laughs> They'll dig him up at some stage, I'm sure. Uh, look, gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. We'll see you next week on Utter Punts. Dave, thank you. Thank you. Jim, thank you. Cheers, mate. Ollie, thank you. And look, if you're a Giants fan or a Browns fan, things can only get better. It's not quite true. That's what true. Tony Blair told us, and we all know Things can only out. get worse if you're a Giants fan. Let me tell you, it's going to be a rough old season. We will see you next week on Utter Punts.